I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson. Here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Well, we're going to talk tonight to the new executive director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. Vonta Corda II brings more than 20 years of transportation industry experience to his new job. A major research project has been launched to measure economic trends in the region. We'll talk about the Regional Economic Indicators Forums with some of the folks involved. And we'll have the latest business update and a story that was making news 25 years ago. You've come to the right place. Almanac North is next. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. This week's show is recorded early because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And Danny, it's hard to believe that December is right around the corner. November <laughs> is going by like that, isn't it? And Christmas will be here before you know it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. We've got some great guests, so let's get started. All right. Thank you very much, Julie. The Port of Duluth Superior is the largest by volume on the Great Lakes, and it's a gateway to global trade for this region. The Duluth Seaway Port Authority is the agency charged with fostering maritime commerce for the port and promoting trade development. A, 20th, uh, or a 2011 study found that more than 11,000 jobs are dependent on cargo shipments in and out of the port. Now, last month, Vanta Corda II came to this town. He came on the board as the new executive director of the Seaway Port Authority, and he joins us now. Mr. Corda, welcome to the Twin Ports. I think you're going to enjoy it here. Now, the, uh, the port, of course, is uh, something that uh, uh, is a huge economic uh, indicator for the city. We, a lot of commerce is done here. What do you hope to bring to the port? Well, first, uh, thanks for the welcome. It's been great uh, since I've been here. Um, the, the port is uh, an integral part of this community, and you can see it right when you come across the hill. Uh, the whole town just uh, surrounds it, uh, and it's, it's wonderful to uh, um, be a part of that. What I see is the opportunity for a continuation of the great things the port has done over the past really 100 years. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you arrived at this position because uh, you know, you're probably going to be on this show pretty often. People want to get to know you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, 20 years of uh, practicing uh, transportation and logistics. Uh, I came uh, to this position uh, last from a oil field services company uh, managing $350 million worth of global spend. Mm -hmm. um, why come to Duluth? It's because it's such an exciting opportunity. Uh, it's an exciting place to be. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit odd for me as an outsider because I, I walk into this position and it strikes me that um, uh, it's somewhat of a secret that what a wonderful place this is and um, the great opportunities that uh, this region can provide. How is the port and Lake Superior different perhaps from what you've experienced over the past few years in the Gulf? Um, you know, it, it's really not because at the end of the day it's transportation. Uh, it's the, the simple fact of uh, blocking and tackling. That's what I know. And, and one of the, the reasons they, they looked at my profile was that I was a, a practicing transportation individual and they wanted somebody to bring that to the table. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, having that background and that knowledge um, allows me to uh, um, seek out opportunities that uh, uh, other candidates might not have uh, brought to the table. Mm -hmm. How much of the job do you see as really sales and marketing of the Duluth Port? 
uh, all of it. <laughs> I, I think it's a great, uh, of great importance that we get out into the community. This is a, a, a definitely a shareholder uh, based position and a lot of people that you need to reach out to. Uh, Davis Helberg, one of the former uh, um, port directors, uh, uh, had written um, that the port has many different touches many different people and he went through a list of 20 right off the top of his head. So how do you market a port? Um, so for us the the biggest thing that we want to see is to promote the maritime industry and the transfer of product um, uh, because that is the key function. Where of do you do that Vonta? Um, we do it everywhere. To me every shipper is a customer every uh, person who who has freight is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, the port just received a, a $10 million Tiger grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. How do you see that money and the, the project that's going to come together with it uh, help improve the port's ability to handle cargo? So the way uh, that we talk about the Tiger grant uh, at the port is that it is setting the table for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. We have the CND dock, which is prime port real estate um, that is deteriorated due just to time. Mm -hmm. And it gives us an opportunity to put um, real infrastructure in place for our future. That is something that needs to be sure. marketed. And that's what we, we lack down at the port is uh, enough space to market that is available. Uh, we are somewhat limited and that C&D dock, once completed, gives us a, a blank sheet to go and market to, to a whole host of uh, industries. So how are this year's figures stacking up? Good year, bad year, a uh, great year? Um, it's, uh, it's about the same year as we had last year. We're going to get a little bit more uh, grain here to close out the season, which will put us just slightly above. Um, uh, on historical terms, it's a little bit uh, lower than uh, we'd like to see and, and hopefully we'll get those numbers. Is it a harder uh, port to sell to others because of our uh, seasonal changes? Uh, I don't believe so. As okay. a practitioner, um, what I always uh, considered was reliability. And if you have that portion that's out of your calendar and you know it and you can count on it, it's pretty easy to plan around. Are there certain cargoes or types of cargo that that you see really being growth opportunities for us at this point? Well, um, I feel like the port's history is its future. Um, I think the United States is going through a natural resource renaissance and it's really driven by uh, cheap energy. And um, like it, don't like it, we really can't make a comment on it, but it's here and it's having some real effects. And Wall Street is starting to to place bets and they're, uh, um, they're putting those bets on manufacturing facilities that are coming back to America. That story has not fully been written, but it's a very exciting one to follow. And I think that uh, Minnesota in particular, uh, this region is very suited for this kind of renaissance in manufacturing and natural resource. So are there certain products then where you could see a good potential for growth? Uh, so the mining products are always going to be a, a stable for the port. Um, I think that forest products uh, is an interesting um, uh, dilemma here. We have in Minnesota a huge, huge harvest that, that doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I don't know if, if that gets figured out or not, but we'd like to see uh, um, some solutions around that. Um, Apex just put out a... Uh, uh, a report on forest products and uh, it should be uh, hitting everybody's desk here soon and should get a lot of play. Right. And then uh, the agriculture here in uh, Minnesota is just tremendous. I was down at AgriGrowth two weeks ago and uh, my gosh, what a group. They are well organized and well focused and uh, a really a source of of uh, great economic power here sure. in the state. All right, Vanta Coda, the new Port Authority Director, thank you. All right, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it.
Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. In Duluth, the waterfront has become the focal point of the city's economic development efforts, whether it's tourism in Canal Park or the Lake Superior paper mill. But in Superior, the other side of the bay has remained untouched. In the Connors Point area, prime waterfront property is used to store semi-trailers and mothballed ore boats. City planners are trying to change that. As you travel into our community, you see the harbor, and uh, as it does in Duluth. And certainly our concern is, is can we uh, turn it into a more positive thing for our community and, and slow down a lot of those cars who are traveling through our community. Today, the city brought expert consultants, superior business people, and civic leaders together in an intensive planning session. The idea is to come up with a number of proposals for developing the waterfront and then present those plans to the community. It is that citizen input that is expected to make the waterfront development a success. In, in some cases, it, the plan is produced and, and it sits on the shelf for 10 or 15 years because it doesn't work, you know, they, it doesn't work or the citizens can block it because they don't like it. And um, I think some of the best planning usually and some of the greatest visions come from the people that are here right now. But tomorrow, the first ideas of what the new waterfront could look like will be unveiled. After that, there will be many meetings and a lot of time for improvements. John Schottel, KDLH News. Research is already underway in a new effort to provide reliable data on economic trends and business opportunities in northeast Minnesota and northwest Wisconsin. Every six months, regional economic indicators forums will be held to release the findings of the ongoing research. The National Bank of Commerce is funding the project and research is being conducted by local colleges. We have a large group joining us with more. Steve Burgess is the CEO of the National Bank of Commerce. Jim Skurla is director of UMD's Bureau of Business and Economic Research. Zamira Simpkins is a professor in the UWS Department of Business and Economics. And Bob Hoffman is a professor in the College of St. Scholastica's School of Business and Technology. And thanks to all of you for being here. Steve, your, you. your bank has taken the initiative to fund this effort. Why is it important uh, in your mind to to collect and really analyze these economic indicators? Uh, the bank feels that the uh, knowledge is very powerful in trying to develop uh, strategies in, for, in order to have business improvement and economic growth. So we want to provide that knowledge and provide the mm -hmm. opportunity for the universities to work together, the business and the universities work with each other, and the students to work with business and the universities. Any and all of you can answer this. What economic indicators will be looked at, and what do you intend to do with the information? There's going to be over 20 indicators that we're looking at. And give you an example, we're going to focus on the labor force, housing industry, and, and just the economic uh, variables like the port, sure. uh, as we just talked about earlier here. So that what's different about this kind of research though is, is the region we're looking at, that we're actually looking at a 100 mile radius from the twin ports here. So we're actually looking at uh, eight counties in Minnesota and seven counties in Northwest Big Wisconsin. Area. But the reason we're doing that is because we've discovered that we're all one region here with commuting and people going to work. They travel a long distance to get to work yeah. and shopping in different regions. So that it's going to help our economic development efforts instead of competing with each other across the bridge or you know town with or counties competing against other counties. Yeah. That it's really going to help to do it on a 15 county basis. So Zamira, every once in a while then you'll be getting together to review the information you've gleaned? Precisely, and really national indicators, state level indicators are valuable, but if you think about county level indicators, they're not always valuable, and the two indicators that we're generating are mm -hmm. the business confidence and consumer confidence and expectations indicators. And those are the ones that businesses use to make better decisions, informed decisions, and also for long-term planning purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's really the overall purpose of this Regional Economic Indicator Forum. 
Bob, talk about the the information gathering process. How how do you collect the information to to measure regional business confidence or regional consumer confidence? And we're doing that through a survey that was mm -hmm. put together by the students who are working uh, with us, and and uh, they're now sending out the survey. And that's one of the things that we're really working on is how we can get the business community to be aware of the survey and how important it is for them to get um, fill out the survey and so we can gather that information. And we started working with the chambers and that seems to be working reasonably well. And now we'll follow up um, with other chambers and with uh, phone calls. But we're hoping as this process unfolds that it will just build every year, that as it becomes known how important the forum is, that more and more businesses will expect to see the survey coming in the mail or you know, by internet and that they'll then make a point of filling out the survey. Mm -hmm. So when you have these forums, do, do you expect businesses then to come to the forum to meet with you and your, your analysis? Uh, yes, Dennis. We will be sending out invitations throughout the northwest region or northeast region and uh, we're excited about the opportunity to maybe pull two or three hundred yeah. people together. When could that first forum be held? It's going to be in March of 2014. What kind of response are you getting so far? Because you, you talked about sending out surveys to, to businesses, but in the business world, uh, particularly in private business, often that information is pretty closely guarded. You know, they don't want to talk about their sales, they don't want to talk about their financials. How, how do you pull that out of the business community in a non-threatening way? Well, I think one of the important things to realize is that people want local information. Mm -hmm. And I think people realize that if they're going to learn about their local economy, they've also got to contribute some information. So that the response has been excellent because people want to know more about yeah. the economy here and not just national statistics. So this forum is not going to be just numbers that you can just search or Google and get off the internet. We're trying to get a local focus, especially with the business and the consumer confidence survey. And that's going to be, I should add to Bob's comment there, the consumer confidence one is actually patterned after the University of Michigan consumer mm -hmm. confidence that you see every month. So that we're actually going you know, to overlay that so that we'll be able to compare the national sentiment of consumers versus the local one. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll really help the local economy sure. and the policymakers. So Zamira, who will do the research and how will they do that? Will they go knocking on doors or what, what, ha what happens? <laughs> uh, so with a business consumer survey, the students are generating responses College students? through online, uh, internet, or mail responses. For consumer survey, we were doing telephone surveys uh, because we have generated a region representative sample and a calling randomly selected households within those 15 counties and are basically asking consumer related questions uh, how they would rate their current financial conditions. What are their expectations about the future? Are they planning to purchase major appliances and things like that? And the purposes for generating the responses for those questions is that we will create a consumer confidence index, uh, index of current economic expectations, and then uh, also current economic conditions. Mm -hmm. And actually the index of consumer expectations is considered a leading economic indicator because it helps uh, forecast recessions or expansions as if they're about to happen. So by looking at those indicators and businesses can see that there is an increase in consumer confidence so they can plan on expanding their yeah. business or vice versa if it's a recessionary effect. Mm -hmm. And talk about some of those real ways in which businesses can use this information in their day-to-day -day operations and their strategic planning. Well, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, cons consumer goods, future purchases. Mm -hmm. We'll mm -hmm. also be looking at real estate trends, um, how many vacant lots there are, what the absorption rate is of the uh, different developments that are around town and around the region. Um, might be looking at uh, Port Authority information, um, transportation information, uh, useful stuff that's used yeah. in strategic planning and help businesses plan their future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a huge amount of, of data that's being collected. Bob, who's going to manage all of this and, and that's, that's a really keep it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just raise your hand. Yeah, actually, it, real, that'd be yeah. me, I think. <laughs> and I think that's one of the real challenges is that mm -hmm. is that we're going to assemble some amazing information, and I think that the the real 
uh, challenge will be to present that in, in a way that um, makes sense to a business person, that you're not drowned in the data. I think what's going to help a lot is that mm -hmm. this will be done every six months, and it will give us an opportunity, like this first survey, both in the consumer and the business, we have questions to measure how businesses and consumers are responding um, to Obamacare mm -hmm. and whether plans are changing. And that, that information should be, in and of itself, of great interest. So I think the real challenge will, and I defer to, to the other people here, I think they've had much more experience than I have, in, in presenting that material in ways that people can make sense out of it and use it to make good decisions. So your best guess as you go into this project now, what is the economy of this 15 county area like today? I, I would say it's been slowly recovering, but, but as a lot of indicators think, it, it varies by industry and by county, sometimes depending on what industries they have. And that's one of the things that we want to track. We have some winners and losers in the, in the region, and I think if we highlight that, and I think that's where the policymakers can see who needs the help and who's doing well on their own. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and sometimes you can play to your advantage too and maybe increase something that's doing well or work off your advantages. Mm -hmm. Are the students excited about this opportunity? What the, the students yeah. are, are, are much more excited <laughs> than I ever would have anticipated. We chose four <laughs> students at CSS, and my goodness, um, when they began to get going on this, uh, the passion they have, the hours they're devoting to it, um, the debates they have amongst themselves about how to phrase a question, how to interpret data, um, they're having a great, great time. And I think it makes sense. They're doing something that they think matters, that has a connection to the real world, that gets them out of you know, their classrooms. So they're having a great, great time. Do you see these forums as a long-term event? Yes, this this won't last just a year or two. No, th what we want to do, as Bob mentioned, is, is have these every six, month, six months, because what we really want to do is show the trends in the region so that in economics, a lot of times I'm looking for the turning points. Yeah, trending are, takes time. Right, so that a lot, of, a lot of the data that we're actually going to present is going to be about at least 10 years so that we can go back and say, okay, here's what was going on 10 years ago and how can we make it better or you know, is it getting worse? Again, what I look for is what I call turning points. When do, the, when do we turn around the economy or keep it going? And that's the key that I'm looking for when I do look at my data. Mm -hmm. in, in March, we'll have the second data point. We've already established one data pointer in the process mm -hmm. of. You'll have some comparisons. We'll yeah. have comparisons and the start of some trends. Mm -hmm. Steve, what kind of a funding commitment does NBC have uh, in the game here? Um, it's significant, but it's well worth it. And is it long term? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, it okay. is absolutely long term. Uh, we're committed to making this thing happen. Uh, we'd like to see the Twin Ports in the northern region grow and uh, we're committed to help make that happen. Good attitude. All right, well thank you so much for coming in and sharing the information and we're looking forward to uh, hearing how this all progresses over the next couple of years. Thank, thank you. Thank you, so you all very much. much. Thank, thank you. you. This weekend marks the beginning of WDSE's annual Winter Membership Drive. Winter Festival will feature a number of new programs, including a local playlist special on ceramic artist Karin Kramer. And a new documentary will focus on the life and times of Iron Range musician and radio personality Bobby Arrow, the singing Finn. Here's an excerpt from that program. He was doing what freelancing in Chicago, and he was the uh, the main director at an all-female theatric school. Why would you want to get another job? <laughs> Bobby landed a job hosting the early morning show at WHLB in Virginia. He called it Bobby Time. You know what you've got? You've got Bobby Arrow on your dial. Bobby, I love you, yes. It was Bobby Time. Yes, music country style going round and round again on a Bobby Time get-together. 
And, of course, down the line, we've always got good news about good sponsors. We hope that you'll pay attention to the messages and enjoy all of the music that we've lined up for you again. I was reading in the paper last week where a guy died and they read his will and they found out that he left $50,000 to a woman who refused to marry him 40 years before. That's a case of real gratitude there, eh? Bobby devoted a portion of his program to the Finnish listening audience. Bobby Arrow had been on WHLB radio for several years before I started at WHLB in 1961. I think a lot of people across the Iron Range uh, wondered if he was almost two different people. <laughs> he, had a, he could put on a very strong Finnish brogue. I'm sure every old-time Finn, it was the Jippos and all the farmers and all the miners around here that were talking in Finglish that were, uh, and he coined that phrase or claim to anyway. And, uh, but it was so as a mix of, it probably was never any one person in, you know, that became a character like his brother was somebody that he could spoof off of and he didn't have a brother, but uh, maybe in a way then all of the people up here were brothers. There's a kinship there, so. I think just the fact that he was proud of his Finnish heritage, you know. He drove people nuts, I'm sure the, the older people with you know, they would say maybe he butchered the English language, but you know what? I, he found, I think he found his niche. And never done with any intent of being hurtful or malicious. It was uh, always in fun, you know. Are you there? Yeah, this is to me, Bobby, or this Kiyaki Boyka. Sure, I'm playing the record for 15 minutes, and we're going to holler a little bit something about some good sponsors for you, too. And uh, we want to get the record machines all cranked up here, ready to go rounding and rounding. And a couple of two, three minutes needle scratching here and there and everywhere on the program. So why don't you give us a listen? And right now, let's hope we'll stay quick, get into the program proper before you find out this ain't the proper program. And here's the first record today. Listen to this one right here. Uh, the premier broadcast of Bobby Earl, King of the Great North Woods, is coming up on Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. on PBS North. And I can't wait to see more <laughs> of that, Julie. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you have a cameo uh, role yourself. That's I did. Kind of Bobby Earl was pure magic on the radio. He could make people listen to him and just uh, be absorbed by his personality. <laughs> Well, that's good. Well, our time is nearly up, so if you have a comment on the show, give us a call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. And remember, check out the WDSE website for the latest program information on all that great local pledge programming coming up over the next week. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, you must have some grand memories of working with Bobby Arrow. We worked together back in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, for Denny and all of us here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you in two weeks.